1500 and 820 AM and now on TBD. So we're with Deborah Krasner who wrote a great book called Good Meat, The Complete Guide to Sourcing and Cooking Sustainable Meat. Um, before we took the break, you were basically <laughs> turning me <laughs> off to anything but. <laughs> I mean, bleh. but um, and we've seen Food Inc. and we've seen we've seen everything. Um, is there a special way to cook sustainable meat? There is, there, is. Are there special approaches? Because we do a lot of that's grilling. that's really why I bought, bought, that's why I wrote the book because uh, for me <laughs> just for you. Oh, I love you, baby. <laughs> because. Um, the, this meat is naturally leaner. It depends somewhat on the breed of the cow and how old it is and where it's been raised. But in general, grass-fed meat is leaner, um, with the exception of pork. And so it doesn't have the insulation that marbling provides, which means that you have to cook it more carefully. It's not technically any more difficult, but you need to kind of change the way you cook. Mm -hmm. So if you're searing something, you need to sear it very rapidly at very high heat. I use a cast iron pan. I put coarse sea salt on it, and I wait till the salt pops, and then I put the meat down. So it gets this gorgeous sear. Um, before you do that, you want the meat to be at room temperature. If it's been frozen, you want to wash it so that it has all, none of those surface proteins. You want to dry it extremely well, and even air dry it on a wire cake grid pan for an hour or even a day in the refrigerator so that the whole surface is really dry. Hmm. So, so then you've cooked it really fast on this cast iron surface, flip it again, take it off and let it rest. I mean, bringing, br getting it dry, bringing it to room temperature and letting it rest after cooking are the three key things to grass-fed beef particularly. Okay, well let's talk taste. I mean, what is the difference in taste? It's much more uh, it's richer, it's more minerally, it has a kind of earthy tone, it has real texture, it, it's not flaccid. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the picture on the cover of the book of that steak, I mean that was a grass-fed steak that came out of my freezer. The whole book was shot at my house in Vermont. Mm -hmm. And you can yeah, see... We're on TV now. We can <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that color. And radio's the theater of the mind, so imagine a nice looking steak. But it's also, I just want to say before you continue, yeah. I mean it's... Fellers. a it's a 400-page, beautiful book with incredible pictures. It's like the throughout. meat Bible. Right, exactly. So, so that deep red, that burgundy color, that's anybody can recognize the difference between grass-fed beef and conventional beef. Mm -hmm. And there's another meat cookbook that just came out that's a wonderful cookbook, and it has the photograph of the same steak f from a conventional cow. And you can put the two books side by side in a bookstore and see the difference. Well, let me. I want to take us to a different place because. You know, I see the words organic and natural slapped across more and more products across the board, but meat products. And my sense is that the big supermarket chains have found, you know, the words that people are now... Organic used to be kind of too crunchy and hippie and peace and love. <laughs> but now it's mainstream, and I'm. it's almost like they're co-opting those terms to fool the consumer. Is well, that so accurate? what do you look for? What do you look for? I to look find for 100 percent grass-fed if okay. I'm buying beef. If I'm buying lamb or pork or chicken, I look for pastured. But labeling is very important, and I think clear and accurate labeling is something that we should all be working for. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I think that there's no substitute for looking in the face of the person who raised the animal and saying, "How was this animal fed? How did it live? How was it processed? How did it die?" You know, tell me about this animal. Mm -hmm. You just brought the show down, man. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, moving on to a little bit of. All right. So subject. let me just explain. Yes. So 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 natural means no antibiotics. Okay. Um, and no, no, it means no growth hormones. It does mean antibiotics, but no growth hormones. Mm -hmm. Organic means it's been fed organic feed. I'll give you a, a really graphic example. Near me in Vermont, there's a, an organic egg farm, and I visited it, and it, it has cage-free organic eggs. And all of the hens, and there were probably several hundred of them, live in a huge barn, not in a cage, but the barn is the cage. And it has little windows with chicken wire on them, and you, as you walk by the barn, you see all the little beaks sticking out the windows. They're all crowded around that window. Do they say, help me! Exactly. Help me. It, it, they're, they're, it, they look like prisoners, right. and, and, and it smells horrible. It's cleaned once a year. There's a huge exhaust fan going 24-7. Mm -hmm. But they're fed organic chicken feed that's grown in, in our state, so it's local organic feed. 
They are indeed producing organic eggs, but those eggs look nothing like a farm egg. A farm egg from a chicken that's raised on pasture has a, a deep pumpkin orange yolk, right. and it sits high on the yolk. I mean, there's a picture in the book of one of my eggs right. that we just cracked on the counter to show you the difference. If you get you know, an organic egg and a real farm egg and you put them side by side, Again, anyone really can see All right, well, let me let me play the devil's advocate because while you, yes, you certainly can talk about you know the 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 less than human or the inhumane treatment of animals. Most people out there, I mean, most non foodies, you know, guys are going to go like, does that really, you know who cares? Fried eggs are fried eggs. No, no, no. But if you it's organic, care. it's and better it's, for the environment. I know that, but I'm saying that's that's the message that I don't think is. I think. A lot of this is a very complex message delivery for for meatballs, and I'm proud to be one. Uh, but, I, but but because there are layers of of reasons and rationales for why this is important and why it's good for you. First, it and, tastes good, and I don't think Let's the industry is getting that out. I think you know once you've said sustainable once, um, and, and you know chefs talk about it and all that. That it, it's the assumption is that everybody gets what the hell you're talking about. I don't think they do. Okay, so it tastes better. Okay, it's better for your health. It's better for the farmer and to support family farms. It's a way to support agricultural landscape so it doesn't become developed landscape, mm -hmm. and you can save the planet. I mean, it's like it, it, if if there was a bumper sticker, chain. it's a food chain. Okay, not to mention petroleum dependence and all the other exactly. stuff in terms of all exactly. the travel costs. And the reason that sustain sustainable is important, you're exactly right, is that this is the future. That is Glenn Babcock. From Naj Restaurant talking <laughs> back here, just in case nobody knows who Well, that is it the future, or are the big, you know, the big farm machines going to still dominate the supermarkets and the, everybody's consciousness? I don't see how they can. I mean, I think that the price of energy is going to become higher and higher, and I think that it's harder and harder to sustain producing animals in the way that we've produced right. them. So, although this is right now 2% of the beef market, for example, mm -hmm. uh, it's not a niche. It's, it's really the future. It's a There's growing no, market. Yeah, it's a very much growing market. I mean, Costco and Walmart are talking about it. Well, somebody asked us before we went on air, they're like, will you ask her about Costco meat? Because I want to know where that's from. I'm like, it's not from a farm. I can bet you money no, on that. No, as far as I know, it's not grass-fed. Right. But I can tell you that I just heard about a big conference that, that the biggest retailers were at talking about it. And I also know that Whole Foods is discussing an initiative to do a five-step program for all of their proteins. Mm -hmm. All right, I want to jump in because we're, we're down to about a minute and change. I know, but I want to talk about some of the recipes. Uh, we will, but I want to make sure before we wrap up, tell people how to find this book very quickly. Oh, it's in every bookstore. It's on Amazon. You can get it anywhere. Good Meat, How to Find and Source, uh, How to Source and Cook Sustainable Meat. Okay, great. All right, well, there are over 200 recipes in here. Tell us, we don't have a ton of time, but tell us how you went about picking out recipes for the book. Well, the first thing was that I wanted to have a recipe for every part of every animal, from nose to tail, inside and outside, um, so that you could buy animals by the half or the quarter and have a recipe for every single part. So um, I did that for beef, for pork, for lamb, for rabbits, for poultry, and for eggs. Mm -hmm. And um, and the recipes, you know, they came from lots of different kinds of inspirations, some from culinary traditions that interested me, like uh, Middle Eastern food, some from standing in my kitchen and just thinking, what would this taste good with? Some from friends. I had a Thai friend who came and cooked with me some of the odd bits that I'd never cooked before that were very familiar to her. Where'd the popcorn recipe come from? Uh, that that wait, what's the name of the popcorn recipe? I don't have the well, book in front of me. It's popcorn with, with bacon, bacon fat, bacon, bacon and, and maple, maple syrup. syrup. You should have brought some of that with Isn't you. Isn't it interesting that we both remembered that verbatim? <laughs> um, uh, actually, that was my daughter's idea. I loved it. It's and just we love your it. daughter, too. <laughs> there we go. And the right. pig candy, we got to talk about pig candy. Oh, pig candy, tell us. Pig candy is um, peanut brittle with bacon and uh, chili pepper. Yum. Truth that bacon makes everything better. It's, it's right, true. exactly. <laughs> we also better. noticed there was a bunch of cider recipes. You remember that, that old saying, there's always room for bacon? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so there was a bunch of recipes with cider. So David sort of said to me, is that new? And I was like, no, people always do things with cider, right? right? But I live in Vermont where it's easy to get the murky stuff in the gallon right. jugs that fresh. And it c turns to alcohol. Do you, guys, do you guys have, I mean, do, do uh, Kyle and uh, Tiffany use cider in their stuff? Absolutely. Both of them do, actually. And not to mention, um, and one thing we'll, we'll taste in a bit, we have stronger 
um, ciders that are blended, they're fortified, and things like that. So they they operate in the kitchen just like you know cider vinegars do, or, or red wine reduction, all that kind of things. But both for our savory and sweet recipes, um, they both employ cider. So what's the difference between hard cider and regular cider? Alcohol. It's just fermentation. It's just, it's just a name for it. So just hard. Yeah. It's just with alcohol and yeah, that's it. Absolutely. It's just the way it's done. And what creates, so of the different ciders you brought today, what's the difference in alcohol content? Um, they're all over the map. So the poire, so you got to remember, pears are not very um, generous with their sugars. They're kind of mild. So they're typically lower in alcohol. So about mm -hmm. 4%. Um, this English cider that still is about 8.5%. English ciders are, are typically stronger. French tend to be a little bit um, lighter. Um, and then this Quebecois one we'll drink next is right in between, around six and a half. And then we do have, um, like I brought some Pomo from Wisconsin that's actually um, eau de vie, made from apples, blended with apple, fresh apple sweet juice. Hmm. That's 19%, but well, it's more like a liqueur. But that's like a dessert wine? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, why don't, you, why don't you pony up that next uh, cider? We'll try <laughs> okay. that. And Deborah, we want to thank you thank for coming you. in. We, we haven't covered half the ground we wanted to cover. I yet. know. There was so much we wanted to talk about. So, and at some point, I want to talk about how you, how a per, well, you know, we have 45 seconds. You buy, you buy a half a pig or half a cow. Who, who can do that? Where do you put all of it? Well, first of all, you can create your own meat CSA and split it with three What's or four. What's a CSA? For, a, a community supported agriculture. So you can go in with three friends, buy half a cow, divide it up very easily, and and have a big box of meat that will fit in the ref, the freezer section of your refrigerator. So you don't have to buy a chest freezer, and you can do that over and over again. So you always have good meat at a reasonable price. Mm -hmm. And the the m most interesting part of the book to me is a series of decision trees about how to fill out a cut sheet. So if you order meat in bulk, you can understand what all the choices are for every part of the animal. And that's okay. in the book, right? And that's in the book. All right, all right. well, this well, we is Deborah, Deborah Krasner. We'll want to hit it. Good Meat, the complete guide to sourcing and cooking sustainable meat. Check it out. Okay, this is David and Nikki Nellis for Foodie and the Beast. We do have to take a quick break, but when we come back, we're going to be sipping on cider, and we're going to talk about going meatless. And guess who's the foodie and who's the beast. <laughs>